supporting rural agriculture, community livelihoods, food production, urban water consumption, and healthy species and ecosystems. The next speaker researches the complex interaction of political, economic, and legal factors in water use for arid regions. As a PhD student in the School of Sustainability, her research is responsive to the increasing responsive to the increasingly um, contentious nature of water allocation and use decisions as climate change intens intensifies and yearly rainfall becomes more variable. So please welcome Katie Wright. There we go. Hi, my name is Katie. I'm a fifth year PhD student um, in Arizona State School of Sustainability. And my research for the most part looks at the Colorado River and thinks about how we can manage water scarcity in both, in both the short term and the long term. So uh, sometimes when I get these presentations, there is a tendency to talk only about solutions. And I decided today that I didn't want to focus on uh, giving perfect solutions as much as I wanted to give you the tools to think about what makes effective water policy so that when you're thinking about making those choices, you can have some criteria to hold up against that. So, often I get asked, why are water levels low? And I like to make three distinctions, because oftentimes we talk about climate-induced scarcity and population growth-induced scarcity, um, but we don't talk about policy-induced scarcity. So, climate-induced scarcity is one that we're all very familiar with. This is higher temperatures, lower rainfall, they're going to alter the timing and flow of available water supply. Um, but we also have population growth and new scarcity. This is just cities are getting bigger and they need more water, they tend to be in arid regions, and so there's a mismatch between the water supply and the water demand. But the one we don't talk about is policy and new scarcity. And this is the role of institutions, policies, and legal frameworks that actually provide incentives to overuse water. And that's the one that we'll be focusing on for the most part tonight. Because in the long term, economists like to say that we can change anything. We can change institutions, we can develop new technology, you know, people might move, we might have better technology to give water to more people. But in the short term, we're kind of constrained with the rules that we have. So how can we think about working within those rules, or how can we think about solutions that fit under the rules that we have already? So the argument I'm going to make and the framework I'm going to give all of you is solutions to water scarcity should consider three things. I'm gonna walk us through that. First, they need to consider the legal system that allocates water. Second, they need to consider the local systems that already govern, govern water. And finally, and most importantly I would argue, they need to consider and respect the data limitations that exist. Okay, so how many people know what prior appropriation is? Okay, I see one person that I've taught who knows that. <laughs> um, so prior appropriation, all of you should know this because this is what ultimately allocates water in the West. The water that is used in the city or the water that is used in a field is governed by prior appropriation. And this was developed in the early 1800s during the gold rush. Um, and what it was designed to do was to encourage development while preventing speculation. So essentially, if you were a farmer, you would go to a water court and you would say, I want this amount of water and I want to use it for this purpose. And the court would say, okay, well first you need to tell us um, where you're using this water and you also need to prove that you are putting it towards something called beneficial use. What is beneficial use? Well, it was for agriculture, for industrial, or for municipal uses. Anything outside of that did not qualify as beneficial use and did not get awarded a right to use water. Second, there was another criteria called use or lose it that was essentially to prevent speculation. So what this meant is if you did not show that you were using every drop of water that you asked for, for what you said you were using it for, that water was taken away over time and given to someone else. So you can see that in 2020, 2022, excuse me, we're much further ahead of time. Um, in 2022, this might create some issues. Because if we care about environmental purposes or conservation purposes, those don't tend to qualify as beneficial use. Or if we have farmers implementing uh, water saving technology on their fields, they're not using all of the water they originally had, well, that doesn't count. So it's gonna get taken away. They can't trade that water. 
So this is the legal framework we're working under right now. Finally, and most importantly, is how this allocates water. It allocates it by something called seniority. This means that if you filed your water right in 1880, in 2022, everyone who has an 1880 water, 1880, 1880 water right gets their water first and you just work your way down the line. If you decide that you want to change that beneficial use or you want to move your water somewhere else, you have to go through an incredibly lengthy process that says not a single person in the entire area is affected by your decision to change. So what I'm trying to paint this picture of is when we're talking about water policy and moving water or changing water uses, we need to remember that that's already defined. We aren't working in a costless system and we're not working with rights that just you know, can be changed easily. It's incredibly costly and it's already defined. Second, local institutions have played a large role in allocating water that under prior appropriation as well. So these are your irrigation districts, your conservancy districts, and conservation di districts. Um, in the early 1900s, many of these districts developed to address the questions of who's going to pay for water infrastructure and how are we going to enforce that people pay for that water infrastructure because water infrastructure was incredibly costly. So while these local institutions played a huge role in addressing and facilitating growth in the past, they addressed issues of infrastructure. Climate change, though, changes what problem these institutions are, are now facing because it's not a matter of delivering water someplace, it's a matter of how much water can we deliver. So these local institutions are still making decisions about where water can be and how we're going to use it. Again, they're still doing this, though, all under the prior appropriated doctrine. Finally, my favorite part, data availability. So oftentimes we talk about water scarcity, and inherently that's a data question, because we're describing a mismatch between water supply and water demand. And solutions to water scarcity need to also have that measurable aspect to them. But water data is incredibly limited. So part of my research actually develops these data sets so that we can answer some of the questions we're concerned about with water and quantify it. Because good policy with water that manages water scarcity well is going to have a component where they can actually measure what they've done. But this unfortunately leads me to my last point, which is descriptive, descriptive statistics are not causal inferences. And I realize that most people probably don't understand what that means, so I have an example for us. So if we have the city of Phoenix, um, and let's say that the city of Phoenix uses 300 gallons per person. This is an outrageous claim, so it's just for the ease uh, in interpretation. Okay, so they decided they want to save water through zero escaping. This is really popular right now. And they find that at the end of the year that people are now only using 100 gallons per person. And they cite this then as a success. The program has saved, they argue, 200 gallons of water. But the problem is 100 gallons this difference that they've made is a descriptive statistic. What they're saying, though, is a causal argument. They're arguing that the program itself caused water savings. That cannot be done from just a simple difference, and this is why. My little no sign. <laughs> there are lots of other things going on throughout a year. So it might have been a really, really hot year, which means that people didn't spend time outside in their yards, so they naturally didn't take as good of care of their yards. That might mean less water. It has nothing to do with xeriscaping and everything to do with they just weren't outside. You might have a bug problem. There might be a lot of mosquitoes, and people decide we don't want to deal with that, so we're once again going to spend time indoors. We're not going to uh, water our lawns. And so it, you know, the bugs are the thing that change people's behavior. Or finally, a very realistic one, people install low flow toilets. So the difference that we're seeing from 300 to 100 is because some people install low flow toilets and the low flow toilet saves water. And all of those things contribute at the same time to a decrease in water use, which then gives us this 100 gallons. And this is a role of researchers, and I argue economists because I am one, <laughs> um, they can go in and they can statistically take out those compounding things to give you an estimate of how xeriscaping, how much water exactly that program is responsible for doing. So I just want to say that we need to be careful in attributing causality 
because it might just be a coincidence. And this isn't to say that these programs don't work, but it is to say that we have to be very careful with the things that we argue. So, my concluding thoughts. Well, water scarcity in both Arizona and the entirety of the West is incredibly complicated. And don't let anyone tell you that they have the right solution because we are so contextually different that there is no one size fits all. Um, understanding water scarcity then means that we need to understand the legal, prior appropriate doctrine. We need to understand the local, what is your local irrigation district doing? And finally, we need to know what data actually exists and how is it being used. And what that should lead us to think about then is that addressing water scarcity today means that we need to look for solutions that first, work within the legal and local institutions because we're in the short term right now. Second, they use the best available data. And finally, they do not conflate causality with prescription. Thank you.